I am your teacher, Mr. Pachiti, and this is my classroom here in Winnipeg, you idiot. So put away your mobile phones, put away your comments about how if you put away your mobile phones, you won't be able to watch the video. I've been doing this for like two years now. Get a grip. It's time to concentrate. It's time to study. This is raw, and this is graded. <laughs> We are kicking things off with the apex bastard, Randy Orton, who is here once again to apologize, saying his emotions have become unbalanced. He rolls the clock back a bit, saying that 15 years ago in Winnipeg, he was punched in the face by a guy that he knows as Adam, but you all know him as AJ has. I'm just kidding. He was punched in the face by Edge. The crowd start chanting, we want Edge, we want Edge. But Randy says Edge can't be here tonight because of what he did to him. And he is truly sorry from the bottom of his heart. He's then interrupted by Kevin Owens. I know we're in Canada, but arguably Owens is the most over full-time babyface in the company at this point. Owens says that he's been dealing with a lot of bellends lately, but He's here because he has an issue with Orton. Kev says that he doesn't think that Randy is actually sorry. Why did you do it, Randy? Why did you do it? Orton says, you don't want to go down that road, Kev. But Kev goes, yes, I do. I was backstage at the Royal Rumble. I saw what that meant to Edge. I saw the look in his eye. You took that away from him. So he asks him once again, why did you do it, Randy? And Randy replies, you think you know me? Well, Edge thought he knew me too. Do you get it? Do you get it? Owen says that these people are fed up of hearing all this talk. They want to see a fight and Orton agrees, but not right now. You gotta wait until hour three, WWE Universe. A strong start to the show with really great performances by both men here. This one gets a B plus. I think WWE are doing a terrific job of keeping us invested in the Orton Edge stuff, considering that Edge isn't going to be on TV every week. I think they're doing a fine job of that. And part of that, is Orton and his reluctance to tell people why he's being a proper little dickhead. And the other part is just these horrible assaults that he's been laying out, all really great stuff. Considering WWE were in Canada last night, I think it was really sensible to pair the hottest baby face in the company, who happens to be from that country, with the most dastardly heel on the roster. I think that was really sensible. And it just meant that crowd investment was at an all time high, leading to some great reactions throughout the night, including in the main event, which we'll get to in a little Little bit. Hmm. Next up, it's Umberto Carrillo versus his cousin Angel Garza. The story here is that both men, of course, know each other inside and out. So, throughout the match, each man had his opponent's offense scouted, and it resulted in a really fantastic match. One of the best matches of the night, I thought. Just really great back and forth. Each man getting equal measures of offense in, and each man, as a result of that, looking fantastic. A few notable spots to talk about. There was a really great sort of reverse suplex where Angel bounced. Umberto off the top rope and then fell back to the mat. That was really cool. There were loads of super kicks. There was a great moonsault uh, to the outside. There was a brilliant Spanish fly from the top rope. It was just balls to the wall action. Very enjoyable indeed. The crowd started really getting into this in the closing three or four minutes. And that was lovely to see, considering that one of these guys wasn't on Raw five or six weeks ago, and the other didn't have a personality five or six weeks ago. So that's promising to see too. The finish comes as the pair trade pinfall attempts, but Angel gets the upper hand, rolls up Umberto, one, two, three, and it's a B plus from me. As I say, I like the match because it was so even, and the finish means that the feud can continue quite easily, because although it was a decisive win for Angel Garza, like it was a clean win, it wasn't the strongest win or anything like that, so I expect to see this continue for a little bit. And also, interesting to note, Rusev being pulled from that Super Showdown match, replaced with Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio looks like he'll be coming back to WWE soon. Well, he'll He'll be there on Thursday, but coming back to Raw soon. So with him being thrown into the mix again, perhaps, I think this could get pretty interesting. Ricochet versus Luke Gallows is up next. And the story being hammered down our throats is that Ricochet is able to outsmart his opponents, even if they're bigger than him, thanks to his speed and his agility ahead of his match against Brock Lesnar on Thursday night. And what I really liked about this is that even though Ricochet would go on to win the match, and that's sensible, he's got the match with Brock on Thursday, that makes sense. They didn't make Luke Gallows look like an idiot. He still looked like a big, strong boy, and he managed to outsmart Ricochet a few times. One notable time, uh, Ricochet coming off the top rope, and Luke just hits this fantastic big boot, and then a load of big power moves, and a few good near falls too. Anyway, as I say, Ricochet ends up dispatching Luke Gallows, and it's a big win for Trevor. 
Trevor. This one gets a B. Nobody in their right minds think that Ricochet is going to win on Thursday. Nobody thinks he's going to beat Brock Lesnar. But WWE are doing a pretty good job of making us think that maybe, just maybe, he can topple the beast. But he won't. He definitely, definitely won't. After the match, and I really like this, the club are backstage, Alistair Black approaches, and they end up beating down Alistair Black, teasing an AJ Styles match, which was later announced in the show for next week's Raw. And this is exactly what Alistair Black needs for a long time. He's just been beating, I don't want to call them jobbers, but people pretty low down on the Raw roster. A match with AJ Styles could be a real star-making performance for Alistair. Anyway, speaking of the beast, out next is Brock Lesnar with his little buddy Paul. You know the score here. Paul Heyman hypes the match at Super Showdown, saying that Brock Lesnar is going to lay waste to Ricochet, but the stakes have never been higher. If Ricochet pulls off the miracle of miracles and beats Brock Lesnar, if if Ricochet becomes the WWE Champion, if, if that happens, he will go on to face Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania. If, if my auntie had balls, she would be my uncle. So that all goes out the window. Brock is going to F5 Ricochet, he is going to win the match, and then he is going to go on to WrestleMania. This isn't a prediction, it's a spoiler. This is your reigning, defending, WWE World Heavyweight Champion, Brock. Lesnar, you know the score. This gets a B plus. I feel like I'm downplaying it a bit because we've seen it so many times before, but put simply, Paul Heyman is the best hype man in all of wrestling today. The guy is unbelievable at making seemingly throwaway matches, maybe that's an exaggeration, but matches that we otherwise wouldn't be as excited for. He makes us excited for them. Paul Heyman is quite simply the man and so is his auntie. Alistair Black versus Eric Rowan is up next. Alistair Black massively selling the beatdown from the club from about 20 minutes prior as he approaches the ring and it looks like Eric Rowan has got this one in the bag or the cage. <laughs> I'm funny. Rowan immediately starts laying into Black, hitting big power move after big power move and every time that Alistair Black tries to mount a comeback he gets dropped hard. However, every time that Eric Rowan goes for a pin, Alistair Black kicks the air out. So Rowan starts trashing Black at ringside and it looks like it's all over. He tosses Black into the ring and then as Eric Rowan enters the ring, he gets hit with a Black Mass out of nowhere and then another one, one, two, three, against all odds. Alistair Black's won. Just great stuff. I wasn't expecting to see Alistair Black playing the underdog at the start of the night, but this works so, so well. The crowd, super invested, super behind Alistair Black and it looks like finally, finally, with the announcement that he will be facing off against AJ Styles on next week's episode of Raw, it looks like he's climbing that ladder. He's going to be knocking on important doors. Another B plus here. Next week is so, so important for Alistair Black. Please, WWE, give them 15 minutes. AJ versus Black could be absolutely sensational if you give it time. Next up is one of those super serial sit-down interviews with Drew McIntyre. And Drew goes on about how this is 19 years in the making. This is something that was promised to him a long time ago, but that never materialized. We get a recap of Drew, his debut on SmackDown as the chosen one. Vince McMahon's there. He is the future of the business. And do you know how many world championships he's won since then? Zero. Impact, ICW, WCPW, pretty much every British indie buried. I'm kidding, of course. He goes on to talk about his time in NXT, his return to the main roster, eliminating Brock Lesnar from the Royal Rumble. It's all fantastic stuff. And with that comes our first A of the show. And WWE just did a great job of hammering home the journey that Drew McIntyre has been on. This 19-year journey, for anyone unfamiliar with it, this did the job in like three minutes. He came across as focused, passionate and most importantly sincere. You just believed every word that came out of Drew McIntyre's mouth last night. A testament to him being one of the best talkers in the biz today. Back to the ring and it's time for an episode of Truth TV. Our Truth's guests tonight are WWE's power couple Lana and Bob. But immediately Lana goes, we're not here to talk. Bobby Lashley has a match with you right now, Our Truth, and this one predictably lasts like 
two minutes. Lashley throws him all over the place. There's one comeback attempt by R-Truth, but it doesn't last long at all. Lashley ends up hitting the spear. One, two, three, Rusev Day chants echoing throughout the arena as this goes on. You want more of the storyline? Of course you do. This gets a C. I'm not really sure what it achieved apart from making Bobby Lashley look strong ahead of the stupid gauntlet match on Thursday. And I guess WWE, they haven't really built that match at all, so they're rushing it, but nobody cares at all. Let's move on. Next up, it's an Elimination Chamber contract signing for the six women who will square off inside the chamber to see who goes one-on-one -on -one with Becky Lynch at WrestleMania, except only five of them have bothered to show up. Lazy Shayna Baszler. Shayna Laszler. Ugh. So Lawler introduces the segment, but Asuka quickly snatches the microphone away from him and she starts running down Shayna Baszler. Then the five women in the ring start signing the contract. There's a nice little moment where Liv Morgan gets the contract, takes it over to Ruby Riot and plonks it down hard, plonks it down hard in front of Ruby Riot. So all five women have signed and then finally Shayna Baszler decides to turn up. She comes in, she signs the contract and then Shayna and Natty square off, but then Asuka attacks Natty from behind, and then Asuka says, bite me, get it, to Shayna Baszler, and it all breaks down, everyone's scrapping everywhere, and then it's Shayna Baszler left on her own in the ring. Then out comes Becky Lynch, she goes straight for Shayna Baszler, they start scrapping and they have to be separated by officials a few times. This one gets a B plus. I enjoyed it, but the focus is entirely on Shayna Baszler, like WWE have tried to throw in a few little bits of mini story, I guess, for the Elimination Chamber match itself, like with uh, with Liv and Ruby and Asuka did a little bit of stuff. But this is entirely about Shayna Baszler, which is fine, but those other women in the match, they just feel like afterthoughts, don't they? This seems so inevitable. I'm still excited for the match at Elimination Chamber, but as I say, it's just all about Shayna, so it feels a bit predictable. So it's difficult to get too excited for that because it just seems like a pointless hurdle on the way to WrestleMania. I, I can't wait for Becky versus Shayna at WrestleMania. I just hope it doesn't come at the expense of all of the other women in the chamber match. That said, you sort of want Shayna to look like an unstoppable beast biting people's heads off. Maybe, maybe not that. The Street Profits are out next. They cut a quick promo. Angelo Dawkins calls Murphy Murph the Smurf. And like four people in the crowd start going, Murph the Smurf, Murph the Smurf, Murph the Smurf. Just all, you've got to feel for them when they're being given that. There's your script, guys. What, what's this? What Murph the Smurf. And bless him, Montez Ford trying to save things, getting all passionate. But he's just said Murph the Smurf. Anyway, we get a singles match between Angelo Dawkins and Murph the Smurf. And this one only lasts like two minutes. It looks like Angelo has things won, but then Seth interrupts, breaks the pinfall up, causing a DQ. So Angelo Dawkins wins that one. And then it looks like Seth and, and the Smurf are going to head backstage. But Montez gets on the mic. So Montez starts calling out Seth Rollins and Seth Rollins, he can't say no to a match, can he? So we get Montez Ford versus Seth Rollins. This one fortunately lasted a little bit longer than the match that preceded it. Uh, during the commercial break, there's a bit of like scrapping going on on the outside and Angelo Dawkins and Buddy Murphy are sent to the back like that. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. And a good match after all that happens. It feels weird to be talking about Seth Rollins, a guy who was a recent world champion, and now he's struggling to put away one half of the street profits. But because of that, it actually made Montez Ford look and feel like a star. Like Seth was really selling for him. So props to Seth Rollins for that because I love Montez Ford. I think he's absolutely class. I think he's got a really bright future ahead of him. So yeah, well done Seth Rollins. Lots more back and forth, some pretty convincing near falls I must say, but eventually Seth Rollins hits the curb stomp and picks up the win, which I think is the right result. As I say, he's a former world champion and Montez didn't need the win to look like a badass. He looked really good last night. Really, really good. So once again, props to Seth Rollins and sorry for another B. It's a lot of Bs on this graded. I really hope the match on Thursday serves as a reminder of how good the Street Profits can be in the ring. I don't expect them to win, but I hope they have a really solid performance in Saudi Arabia. I think, realistically speaking, they're going to be pushed to the background once again following Super Showdown because I don't think they're going to be featured prominently at WrestleMania. That said, prove me wrong, Vince. Please prove me wrong. He's not watching. 
lazy arsehole. Main event time and it's Randy Orton taking on sort of local lad Kevin Owens in the match that was set up at the beginning of the show. Just a few minutes in, Seth, the AOP and Murph the Smurf come and stand at the top of the ramp. Don't you know that's going to distract Kevin Owens? Come on lads, play the game. They then surround the ring as Kevin and Randy go at it. It looks like they're about to get involved but outrun the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders and everybody scraps to the back except for one man and that man is Seth Rollins. And now it's time to talk about the finish. Yes, it really did happen this quickly. So Seth tries to interfere once. He gets up on the apron but gets knocked down by Kevin Owens. And then Owens is standing near the ropes and Seth puts his arm through and starts grabbing Kevin's legs. That distraction leads to Randy Orton being able to hit the vintage Orton DDT which never puts anyone away except for last night because the ref is a horrible bastard. So Orton goes for the pin. Surely he's going to kick out. One, two, three. That's it. The ref fast counts. Orton is the winner. Uh, what? Okay, so the bell has rung. Randy Orton's won the match. Then Seth Rollins grabs a couple of chairs, tosses them into the ring and starts going, go on, you know you want to do it. Let the voices speak to you, Randy. Concerto. Let the voices speak to you. Ugh. But no, Kevin Owens gets up and he grabs one of the chairs and he squares off with Randy Orton. It looks like we've got a chair fight, but Orton rolls out of the ring and heads to the back. But the night's not over yet. Then Kevin Owens rolls out of the ring. He grabs the dickhead referee and he rips his shirt open, revealing a Seth Rollins t-shirt. I can't believe it. They were in cahoots the whole time. Owens ends up dragging the referee in the ring, laying him out with a stunner and then picking him up and power bombing him through a table as Seth Rollins watches on from the top of the ramp like it's the worst thing that has ever, ever happened to him. And I'm not sure what to make of this, honestly. So after a lot of deliberation, I'm going to give this a C, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts as well on this. The comment section is obviously down below. So I personally think this made Orton look a little bit weak, like he needed the help from an outside source to defeat Kevin Owens, when Orton, for many weeks now, has been pushed as one of the strongest characters on TV. Like, he could have just done something truly evil to Kevin Owens to win the match. I don't think he needed Seth Rollins to help him out. That said, on the flip side, I did enjoy the Kevin Owens beatdown of the referee, even though the whole thing was a little bit stupid, and I don't think it, it played out on TV the way that maybe they visualized it in the writing room. It was a bit awkward, a little bit clunky. Key. I did enjoy that and the crowd seemed to lap it up as well. They were really into it and maybe that's because Kevin Owens is from Canada so they were a bit more forgiving than they perhaps should have been but I still sort of enjoyed it. It all felt just a little bit jumbled, not as effective as it could have been, a little bit underwhelming. A little bit weird, you know? Anyway, this episode of Raw gets a predictable B. It's another B. I think there was a lot of good stuff on this show. Nothing really sensational or anything. Although I did enjoy the Alistair Black stuff. I really enjoyed the Drew McIntyre stuff. But I will say that for the past maybe six or seven weeks, Raw has felt like a quicker watch. It's flown by quicker than an episode of SmackDown. And considering that Raw is an hour longer, I think that's a pretty big achievement. And I'm genuinely still enjoying Raw. I've been enjoying it for the last couple of months now. I think it's a pretty decent show. Long may it continue. It, it, it definitely won't. Why are cows bad at dancing? Because they lactose. I'm not here to please you. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. You can follow us on Twitter at Cultaholic. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.